This is going to be the overview for 2 Thessalonians. And this small epistle has three chapters, 47 verses, 1,022 words are around that. The author is the Apostle Paul, and the theme is the second coming. Now, a quick breakdown. Chapter 1 is persecution of believers and also the second coming. Chapter 2 is, is about how the Thessalonians are shaken by letters that's been sent, but it's letters by someone pretending to be Paul or someone credible. And Paul assures them that they did not miss the rapture. You see, these letters were sent to him saying, you know, that's past already. And making them think, well, they're going to face Jesus Christ at the second coming on the receiving end of it instead of being on the winning side. And then chapter 3, you got practical truths to live by while you wait on the Lord. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. I've often thought about this verse and how a tribulation saint could look at it and get comfort. I know that Paul wrote to the church, but a tribulation saint who has a Bible could look at this during the time of Jacob's trouble and look forward to a rest. And you who are troubled, rest with us. When... The Lord Jesus shall be revealed with heaven, from heaven with his mighty angels. You know, he could read this verse and say to himself, you know, it's not going to be much longer and Jesus Christ is going to reveal himself from heaven with all those mighty angels and I'll be going into the millennial rest. There is going to be terror for most people at the second coming. But for the saints, it's going to be a great victory. And Jesus Christ will come in and set up his kingdom. He's not coming in peace. He's not coming to make peace. He's coming in war to make peace. In fire, to be exact. He's got to bring war to get peace. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Mm, nobody's going unpunished. You know, they got that comic book hero, the Punisher. Jesus Christ is the real Punisher. And evil must be punished. And Jesus Christ is going to do it. That fire at the second coming turns into a literal lake of fire on earth that never goes out. It's everlasting destruction. There's going to be a literal lake of fire on earth during the millennium as a deterrent to crime. Second Thessalonians 1.10 When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Notice the phrase in that day. Paul is being heavy on the second coming of Jesus Christ. When you see the phrase in that day it's going to have something to do with the tribulation, the second coming or the millennium. And you're going to see it again in chapter 2. Uh, now, chapter 2, this chapter describes how the Thessalonians were getting letters from people claiming to be Paul. They were trying to make them think that they missed the rapture and that they were about to face Jesus Christ and be on the receiving end of that flaming fire and vengeance that Paul just talked about in chapter 1. Not only that, but on the receiving end of the Antichrist and his persecution and all the dreadful things that would happen during that time. And he tells them not to be shaken in mind about that stuff. In Second Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by, lure, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now remember that the day of Christ covers more than just the rapture, but also the judgment seat of Christ, just as the day of the Lord covers several events in the Bible. Now you see how uh, they've 
they've he says nor by letter ask from us ask from us they've been they've been sent a letter like and it the person who wrote it acted like it was from Paul and it made these people think that the rapture's already passed now if you're trying to teach that they're worried that uh the rapture's about to happen that wouldn't make sense to teach that they're thinking the rapture is about to happen because that wouldn't be a trouble to them. They wouldn't be shaken in mind or troubled in spirit because the rapture is about to happen. It's actually called a comfort a couple chapters back in 1 Thessalonians four thirteen through 18. You're supposed to comfort one another with these words that the rapture is going to soon take place. I mean, they would be waiting for the rapture with open arms. But if they thought the day of Christ was at hand in the sense that the rapture had taken place already and that the judgment seat of Christ was soon to begin at hand, they would be worried sick that they missed the rapture and that they were going to face Jesus Christ coming back in flaming fire taking vengeance. You see, just as the day of the Lord covers more than one event, the day of Christ covers more than one event. You know, the day of the Lord covers a long period of time. Just like, just like it says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So if the day of the Lord can cover such a great period of time, then the day of Christ can cover a big period of time. And it doesn't necessarily have to be talking about the rapture alone. And also consider how you're going you're gonna to have, during the tribulation, you're going to have things going on in heaven. You're going to have things going on on the earth. And I believe the day of Christ has more to do with what, to do with the saints and what's going on in heaven, while the day of the Lord is what the lost people on earth are going to be facing. You're going to, they're going to be facing the tribulation, seeing Jesus Christ at the second coming, and so on. And then in the millennium, you got that still the day of the Lord because a thousand years is as one day. So, I don't believe these people are worried that the rapture is about to happen because then they wouldn't be troubled. They're worried that the rapture is already taking place. They're left behind. They're going to miss the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to face the Antichrist, the tribulation. And most of all, Facing Jesus Christ who's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance. So he says in the next verse, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, what day shall not come? Uh, if you say it's the rapture specifically, then you're going to have to say that this certain falling away here and the man of sin, which is the Antichrist, has to be revealed first. But I don't believe that that day is referring to the rapture. In the Bible, that day primarily refers to when Jesus Christ comes back with us at the second coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. And that's what we've already been seeing that Paul's talking about. So I believe this chapter here is talking about two different days. When you consider how the day of Christ is used and how that day or the day of the Lord is used. Well, the day of Christ is used to refer to the rapture and judgment seat of Christ. That day is primarily a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Bible when he comes back with a sharp two-edged sword to smite the nations. But before he does that, in the tribulation, there's going to be a falling away first which most likely has to do with those who take the mark of the beast in the tribulation time period. And the reason I believe that is because in Hebrews 6, 6, it talks about those who fall away. And without a doubt, Hebrews 6, 6 is doctrinally for the tribulation time period. Specifically would have to do with those who took the mark of the beast and it became impossible to, to renew them again into repentance. I believe the, the falling away and the strong delusion both have to do with the mark of the beast. And that actually takes place in the middle of the tribulation. And uh, so this falling away has to happen before Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse. 
I don't believe this certain falling away uh, that it's in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 has to do with the church, even though the church will also be in apostasy at the rapture, most likely, no doubt. Yeah, also, the man of sin is revealed before Jesus Christ comes back as well. So you've got a falling away, the man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition, before Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse. And this proves premillennial, premillennialism as well. Premillennial Bible believers teach that Jesus Christ has to bring in the kingdom because things are getting worse and worse. And if the Antichrist shows up, that means things are getting bad. Things aren't getting better. You see, postmillennialism teaches that man will bring in the kingdom because things are getting better and better. But actually, it's getting worse and worse. Evil men and seducers show acts worse and worse. And the fact that the man of sin shows up right before Jesus Christ shows up proves that man will be at his worst state in history and will need the Savior to come fix the mess. The man is sin, of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, is the one who in verse 4 opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, already there, just in verse 4, once again, that's putting you in context of something that takes place in the middle of the tribulation. That is, if you believe it's seven years. And, I mean, this is what is called the abomination of desolation, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. That's why, another reason why I believe the strong delusion and the falling away are also two things that take place somewhere during the tribulation that have to do with the mark of the beast. I believe that's where the context is taking us now, is to the middle of the trib when he's opposing and exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped sitting in the temple of God. Now remember that this happens in the middle point of Daniel's 70th week. The Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, will sit in the holy place claiming to be God. So we're going to see how we're now in the context. The context we're in the, talking about the middle of it, of the tribulation. It says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time? And then shall that wicked be revealed, and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance, is going to consume the powers of darkness with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion see how this strong delusion it's I don't believe that it's talking about something that happens at the rapture although obviously people are going to be greatly deceived at that time I believe this strong delusion is connected with something that happens towards the middle of the tribulation, most likely with the mark of the beast. It says that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Who's 100% going to be damned during that time? The people who take the mark. And see, now who's this he? That's a big mystery for this chapter. Who is the he in uh, Second Thessalonians um, chapter 2, look look back up where it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he, he might be revealed in his time, and then that wicked shall be revealed, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the Antichrist, obviously, defeated foe he's not getting very far now look at verse 7 second thessalonians 2 and verse 7 for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let 
until he be taken out of the way. So who is the he? That's the question. I've heard many different, many different um, interpretations. But I believe just by going by the context, the he would be the Antichrist himself. I mean, look at all the other he's. Uh, look at verse 6. Or look, starting, look at it, verse 4. Uh, who's it talking about? Who's the he in verse 4? So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? The he there, that's the Antichrist. And he says, Remember you not when I was with you, I told you these things. Now verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who's the he there? The Antichrist. Now verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed. Who's the wicked? And the Antichrist. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Who's the him? The Antichrist. So, all the he's and the him's before and after verse 7 refer to the Antichrist. So, what you've got in verse 7 is, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Remember the context we're in the, we're not at the beginning of the trib right after the rapture's taken place. We're in the middle. It's already took you to the context of who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's took you to the middle of the trib. Now, if it's still going with that continuation of that, we're talking about something that's taking place in the middle of the tribulation. And what happens in the middle? The Antichrist gets a head wound. And then he comes back a lot worse than he was before. With Satan in full control there. So only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. You see? He gets that, he gets that deadly head wound. In the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is taken out of the way, and then Satan takes complete control of him, and that wicked is revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, that's really not a popular way to look at it, but I just, if I say it's the Holy Ghost, that's the he who now letteth will let. I have to insert that in there. I have to, you know, it's not talking about the Holy Ghost in the verses before or after it. I kind of had to insert that in there if I say that. If I say it's the body of Christ, I kind of have to insert that in there. And I mean, if we're in the middle of the trib, the body of Christ has already been taken out three and a half years before. Verse four even takes place. So that seems like a stretch to me. So... I mean, it's a rough chapter, and you got people that argue back and forth about it. But, but let's look back at Second Thessalonians two and verse nine. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs, and lying wonders. Now, once again, that's reminding me of something, Revelation thirteen, middle of the tribulation, where the Antichrist gets that head wound, and the false prophet is doing all these miracles, deceiving people. It says in Revelation 13, 13, uh, 13, 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. 
so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So there you've got the, the false prophet, the antichrist, with power, signs, lying wonders, mentions deceiving people, mentions the mark of the beast, mentions the antichrist dying with a head wound and coming back. And that's what I believe Second Thessalonians 2 is talking about. And the, the church, the body of Christ, would have done left a few years before this even happens. So, I believe that's what the strong delusion has to do with the strong delusion as well, what they're doing right there. So it says in verse 12 of Second Thessalonians 2 that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the Thessalonians were afraid that they had missed the rapture and that the judgment seat of Christ was about to take place or taking place and they were afraid that they were going to have to face the, the the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in flaming fire taking vengeance. And in chapter 3 you got practical truths while you wait on the Lord. Second Thessalonians 3, 6 Now we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. You see sometimes you have to separate from a brother. If their walk is messed up then they can mess up your walk. It's like when you're walking down the road with somebody, and if you're consistently in fellowship with them, then you're going to copy their walk. If they're walking faster, you're going to walk faster so that you can continue talking. If they're walking slow, you're going to walk slow. And it's like that with your spiritual walk. If you're trying to be on the same pace as the guy who's walking disorderly, then you'll end up walking disorderly. Now, verse 7, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, so walk in tune with someone who you believe lives better than you do. Like Paul. It says in verse 8, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. You see, Paul didn't come with his hands out for food or money or supplies. He paid his way and worked his way through those things. Even though he could have charged people if he wanted to. He wrought with labor and travail night and day so that he wouldn't feel like or make others feel like that he owed them anything. He didn't want to be chargeable to any of them. And he says, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. And that's what he's trying to do here in this, in this chapter, chapter 3, giving you practical truths about how you need to walk while you wait on the Lord. But notice he said, not because we have not power. Paul has the power to, to receive money or to ask for it for being in the ministry. But he doesn't here. He wanted to make, him, make himself an example for the Thessalonians to follow. And he wasn't in this for treasures on earth, but for treasures up above. He wasn't doing it to make a living, but because the gospel was the only reason he was living. It says in verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You see, this is a big one. Every man needs to get out and work in some fashion. He needs to sweat. He needs to do things that make his body ache. And if you don't make it ache from working, then it will eventually ache from doing nothing. He says in verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. If you will go to work, then you will have a lot less time to get into everyone's business and be worried about what everyone else has going on. A lot of the men I work with, they, they complain that complain are the ones who have all this time to sit around and stare at what I'm doing. If they're working, then they wouldn't know my every move. They're busy bodies, but they need to be busy beavers and get busy with their job. See, when you're busy, you don't have time to sit around and worry about what everybody else is doing and wonder to yourself, why is my life not like that? Why can't I do that? Why does he get more breaks than me? Why is he getting paid more than me? You know, all this stupid stuff that you really can't do nothing about, it's just pointless to think about. So you might as well just work and get it over with. But this has been Second Thessalonians chapter 2.